Une lecture de l'Évangile de Jean. Jésus dit aux Juifs qui ont cru en lui, « Si vous restez fidèles à mes paroles, vous serez vraiment mes disciples. Vous connaîtrez la vérité, et la vérité vous rendra libre. » Ils lui disent, « Nous sommes de la famille d'Abraham, et nous n'avons jamais été esclaves de personne. Comment peux-tu nous dire, vous deviendrez libres? » Jésus leur répond, « Oui, je vous le dis, c'est la vérité. Tous ceux qui commettent des péchés sont esclaves du péché. » L'esclave ne reste pas toujours dans la famille. Le fils, lui, reste dans la famille pour toujours. Donc, si le fils vous rend libre, vous serez vraiment libre. L'Évangile du Christ. Father, take these words and speak through them, take our minds and think through them and take our hearts and set them on fire with love for you. For we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, it, it's wonderful to be here. It's a bit, uh, it's a bit disorienting for me because uh, the last time I was here, I think was 44 years ago or 43 years ago. Uh, Wendy and I were just married and I was a student at Dawson Theological College and I was Phil Bristow's student assistant here for a year. So I, I preached from over there a few times. Uh, so I'm looking in the wrong direction. Uh, I also have a relationship with St. Peter's because I was the janitor there for a while. So uh, I feel kind of at home, but kind of uh, disoriented as well. And it's wonderful to be with Bishop Mary and Mark and Nick and, and Chris and Fiona and so many others. Uh, that we've known through the years. Uh, so thank you for having, having us here. I've got a couple of slides I want to show you. Uh, I had a colleague when I was teaching in a seminary who used to say, she was the Old Testament professor, she used to say when she was trying to explain a passage to a class that context is king. What she meant by that was you can't really understand what a biblical passage means unless you understand the context in which it was written she meant the historical context or the literary context in other words the back the historical background of the passage and also how it fits in with the rest of the book in which it's written but i think there's another another way of looking at this idea of context and that is that when you're standing in a certain place you see things differently from if you're standing in another place. Uh, Wendy and I have stood in a lot of African places in our lives. And so because of that, uh, I've learned to see some parts of the Bible in ways that I might not have seen them if I'd stood somewhere else. So here's when, when we lived in Ethiopia. This was our diocese. The, the dark part. It was called the Diocese of Egypt with North Africa and the Horn of Africa. Uh, most countries have many dioceses. Our diocese had many countries. Uh, they've added another country since. They've added Chad, which is right where the diocesan crest is now. Uh, and they're no longer a diocese. They're a province, the province of Alexandria. I was, I was in the, the part on the right, on your right, uh, Ethiopia, Eritrea, Djibouti, and Somalia was my Episcopal area. Uh, four very complicated countries in very different ways. Um, that area where I was the area bishop is now two dioceses itself. Uh, the Diocese of the Horn of Africa, but that little chunk right next to South Sudan that, that is circled that goes right to the border is called Gambella. And that's a separate diocese. When Wendy and I moved to Ethiopia, the first bishop had lived in Addis Ababa, which is the capital, which is a modern African city, you know, lots of traffic and all, bank machines, all kinds of things. We, we lived where most of the Anglican Christians lived, which was in Gambella, right next to the South Sudan border. We could walk to South Sudan uh, in a day. 
Uh, we could drive there if there were, well, there was one road that actually got there. We could drive there in an hour. So, and South Sudan was really unstable, and while we were there, they had a war. So the area of Gambela, where we lived, doubled in population during the next year and a half. So it went from 300,000 people living in that region to 600,000 people, most of whom were dirt poor already before the population doubled, and suddenly they had twice as many people and they had no places to live and nothing to eat and no clothes to wear. So it was a, it was a privilege uh, that God allowed us to work with these dear people who uh, were really quite amazing. Here's one of them. This is a little girl. And this is uh, first Sunday in a new refugee camp. I was asked to preach under a tree the first Sunday that all these several thousand refugees had arrived and they started a new camp just a half an hour or so from where we lived in a place called Itang. And under that tree on that Sunday morning, we had several thousand people. I'm using a microphone today. There was no microphone. So I had to preach to several thousand people with no microphone. We had a translator who translated, I, I think we only used one translator that morning. We translated into Nuer, which is the majority language of the people coming across the border. Uh, this is the offering. So this little girl had been given some grain uh, to eat as part of what all the refugees had received when they first arrived. And she brought her cup of grain up and put her, they put a mat out for people to put their offering and she put her cup of grain on the mat. Uh, Remarkable people. Sometimes people would ask us, they, they'd come to church with us on Sunday and they'd say, these people have nothing. Uh, they don't know what's going to happen uh, in their lives. They, they often don't know where the next meal is coming from. Uh, the weather is a little bit hot. Uh, how many of you thought it was hot this past weekend? Hmm. It was, it was uh, usually by nine in the morning where we lived, it was 30 degrees by nine in the morning. And uh, well, well over that in the 40s, most days of the year by halfway through the day. In the dry season, it, we, we recorded 63 Celsius one day, 143 Fahrenheit, which is the record high in the United States, I discovered. In Death Valley, California, one day in the 1930s, it was 143. So that was not an unusual day in February and March where we lived. So they had nothing. It was too hot. Uh, they, they didn't know where their food was coming from. They, their, their houses were made out of sticks and straw and mud. And yet this is what Sunday morning looked like. It was full of joy, and people would visit us and say, why are these people joyful? And Wendy would say, because they know they are loved. Because they know they are loved. So that brings me to Revelation chapter 7. Uh, I understand some of you are actually studying the book of Revelation, reading through a little book called Revelation for the Rest of Us, which is a really good little book by a guy named Scott McKnight. Uh, I recommend it. Uh, there's another book, if you want to read another book, by uh, a New Testament scholar. The book's called Reading Revelation Responsibly by Michael Gorman, and it's brilliant. Uh, there are lots of irresponsible readings of the book of Revelation, and I'm not going to go into that now. But let me just uh, introduce you to some of the themes in this New Testament reading that we read this morning from the book of Revelation, because it's really quite stunning. Before we read this, before we read this passage, there's another passage, uh, the beginning of chapter 7 of Revelation, in which uh, we're introduced to a crowd of people. John says he, he, he heard that there were, he, you know, he, he saw a group of angels and they told him about a number of people. He sa it's, verse 4 says, I heard the number of the sealed, 144,000 sealed from all the tribes of the sons of Israel. And then it lists 12,000 from this tribe, 12,000 from this, 12,000 from that. 12 times 12 times 1,000, 144,000. 
It's a symbolic number. There have been problems over the years of different groups of people trying to figure out if they were a part of the 144,000. So one group, for example, thought that they were the 144,000 until their membership exceeded 144,000. Then they had to rethink uh, how they were uh, thinking about that. What, what John is saying here is that God knows who his people are. And that his people are a huge group of people. That's what the, the number 1,000 means. And that they are his people. That's what the number 12 means. The number 12 is an Israel number, a people of God number. So 12 times 12 times 1,000. This is the whole people of God. But then, that's what he hears. But then, in the passage we read, verse 9 says, After this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands. So this passage focuses on that group of people. And the first thing that John says is that it's a massive group of people that it cannot be counted. You may, may remember that in the Old Testament, God told Abraham, and Abraham and Sarah had no children, God told Abraham that he would have so many children that they would be like the sand of the sea. He would have so many children that they would be like the stars in the sky. Try and count them, God says to Abraham. And Abraham can't count them, of course. Well, John can't count this number of people either. It's a great multitude that no one can number. So that's the first thing to say about the people of God. The people of God are so massive that we can't count the number of them. This may strike you as strange. In our society in the West, churches tend to be shrinking. Church buildings get closed. Uh, Part of this is our fault as a church. We have done things that have made people turn away. The church has some things to answer for in the long run. But the reality is that at the end, we will see the reality of who's God's, who God's people are. We were privileged to live in a place where the church was actually growing. When I became bishop of the Horn of Africa, I was told by my diocesan bishop that there were 38 churches in, in Gambella. Uh, when we got there, there were 50 churches because in between bishops, they planted 12 more churches. They just didn't tell the diocesan bishop about it. <laughs> By the time we left, there were 150 churches. So every time I, I got the clergy together from the Gambella region once a month, and every time they came, they would say, oh, bishop, we started a new church. You have to come and bless the church. Uh, the, other, the other thing that the bishop got to do was name the churches. So I, I, we went from 50 churches to 150 churches. So I had to start to get really creative about the names of the churches. It became difficult to find new names. But what an amazing privilege that was. That doesn't happen everywhere. It's not going to happen there forever. Uh, but the church was growing. And the church is growing in many parts of the world. And in the end, we will see that God will draw to himself those he chooses and that this will be a huge number of people. So that's point number one. The people of God is massive. Second point is that it's multicultural. This great multitude is from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages. The author of the book of Revelation uses these four terms seven different times in the book. Na nation, tribes, peoples, and languages. So as you're reading through the book of Revelation, you'll discover that this, this people of God are from every nation, every tribe, every language, every people, and he'll change the order once he, he inserts the word kings instead of nations. But he, he's making a point that the people of God is not from one nation. The people of God is from the whole world. The people of God comes from 
every group of people. So in, in our area, in Gambela, we had uh, people from 10 different language groups. So when we got together for our assembly every year, which, uh, what we called a kind of synod, synod was what happened at the diocesan level. But at the local level, we had an assembly. And we met every year. And the first thing that I had to do was say hello to people. But people spoke 10 different languages. So that took about 15 minutes at the beginning of the assembly just to say hello. Then I, everything that was said got translated into New Air and into Anuak. And in the corner, there would be people translating into other languages of languages that several groups of people could understand. So we'd have somebody translating into Arabic in one corner, and that would cover a number of groups, and somebody translating into something else in another corner. It was, it was remarkable. And when we worshiped together, we all had an Anglican liturgy, and it was translated into everyone's language. But how do you do that when you have 10 different languages? Well, the leader would begin in his or her own language, and everyone would respond in their own language. So when you first hear it, it was very strange. Because all you heard was this mess of words. But the more you immersed yourself in that kind of worship, the more you loved it. It was like a little picture of heaven. People around the throne from every language, John says. Well, we didn't have every language, but we had 10. And it was a remarkable, a remarkable time to be able to worship together with people from all those language groups. I had uh, one of my clergy, who was New Air speaking, uh, complained one morning. We'd said morning prayer among the staff at the Anglican Center where we lived. And he said, why is it that when we say the Sanctus, it takes the New Air so much longer to say it than everybody else? And everybody else is finished and we're still talking. I said, well, Isaac, the word in English for holy is holy. The word for holy in New Air is Malal Goidara. It takes a lot longer to say Malal Goidara three times than to say holy. He said, yeah, you're right. So there were some, there were some glitches when, when you're trying to do this, but it was a wonderful experience. So it's a huge group of people. They're from every part of the world. They're a multicultural, multilinguistic group of people. The third thing that John, the author, tells us is that they are, here's the old-fashioned word for it, they are saved. They're before the throne and the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands and crying out with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And later on, we have a question. Who are these clothed in white robes and where have they come from? If, if you're in heaven at any point and somebody asks you a question, the right answer is, sir, you know. So that's what John said. Sir, you know. And he said to me, these are the ones who have come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. So there's all kinds of imagery here. Sacrificial imagery. Uh, the, the blood of the lamb cleanses in the temple, in the Old Testament, in the tabernacle, in the desert. The blood of the sacrifices wipes away sin, covers sin. Well, this is what's happened here, except that it's not the blood of animals. It's the blood of Jesus. And we, we say this kind of thing every time we do the liturgy, every time we do the Eucharist. We talk about the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Well, that's what is being talked about here in this passage. Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. These are they who have come out of the great tribulation and washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. They are saved. Old-fashioned way of saying they have been rescued. They have been rescued. They've been rescued from more than one thing, but one of the things they've been rescued from is their own sin. Their sin has been taken away. Their sin has been covered because of what Jesus has done for them. So that's the third thing. It's a big group of people. They're a multicultural, multi-ethnic people. They are forgiven people, rescued people, but they are also worshiping people. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. 
They, they fall down on their faces, it says in verse 11, before the throne and worshiped God saying, Amen. Now, listen to this part carefully. Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might. Seven words of praise. You, you may have already noticed I've used the, the number seven a couple of times in this sermon. The, the number seven is the number of completeness. God made the complete world in seven days. So whenever you run across the number of seven in the book of Revelation, it's a number of completeness. They are offering God complete praise, perfect praise. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. I'm glad we sang the first song we sang today, the first hymn we sang, Holy, 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 which is from a couple of chapters earlier in the book of Revelation in which the people of God fall down before the throne of God. They, they have thrones, but they never seem to be sitting on them because whenever the angels are singing, they're falling down before the throne and the angels are singing all the time. So they fall down before the throne and they take off their crowns and they throw them before the throne, thanking God for everything he has done for them, for making them, for redeeming them, for being who God is. So they are forgiven people, but they are also, because of that, worshiping people. But there's a dark side to the passage too, because they are a people who have suffered. These are the ones who have come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. Verse 16, they shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. The sun shall not strike them, nor any scorching heat. These people have been through immense difficulty. Now, the word tribulation simply means suffering, means ordeal. Jesus said, in this world you have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world, he said. These people have been through the great tribulation. When the war started in South Sudan, uh, when Wendy and I lived there, we had lots of opportunity to meet newly arrived refugees. And we would ask them about their experience, which was sometimes hard to listen to. I remember one day we were talking to a group of newly arrived folks and we said, well, what did, what did you manage to bring with you? And they said, well, only what we could carry. Well, what could you carry? Well, mainly our children. And what did you leave behind? Expecting them to say, well, we left houses and, you know, our various clothes, and ver which was all true. But their answer was, well, our, our elderly, they couldn't run fast enough from the bullets. They couldn't run in the heat as well. And so many of them died on the way. That's what tribulation is. That's what the reality of suffering is for so many people in our world today. There are more than 100,000 refugees in the world today. We had the privilege of knowing some of them. Dear people who uh, were forced into a, a period of intense suffering in their lives through no fault of their own. They were hungry and they were thirsty. But this passage says that this group of people around the throne shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. Then there's the passage that I didn't understand at all until I got to Gambela, Ethiopia. The sun shall not strike them, nor any scorching heat. Look, I'm a Canadian. Like, it gets a little warm in the summertime for a couple of weeks. But the sun doesn't strike you in Montreal. There isn't scorching heat in Montreal. Yeah, we sweat a little bit at night for a few days. But if you've got no shelter, you've got no food, you, you can't carry water with you, the sun strikes you. The heat is scorching. And many running from bullets don't survive. But these people gathered around the throne have come out of the great tribulation. 
In other words, this suffering, the evil of the world, the darkness of the world will not last forever. There will be an end. There will be a finishing time for all the suffering and evil of the world. Listen to the last verse. The lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd. Remember Psalm 23? The Lord is my shepherd. What will the shepherd do? He will bring you to streams of water. Well, here it says in Revelation, he will guide them to springs of living water. Psalm 23 will be fulfilled. And the last verse of this passage, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. That's a quotation from one of the Psalms and from the book of Isaiah. There will come a time when all tears will be put away, that all tears will be finished, when all mourning and crying will be ended because death itself will be put an end to. These are suffering people who have come out of the great suffering. Finally, last thing to be said about this passage is that these are people who are in God's presence. They are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And the one who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. That's a good English translation of this. A more literal English translation would be something like this. He will entent them with his presence. He will put his presence around them like a tent. We will live in God's presence, John says. It was a privilege to live among a group of people who knew something of the joy of Jesus, even in the midst of their suffering but who knew that one day that suffering would end and that one day all will be joy in the presence of our God. Let us pray together. Father, we thank you for your word which speaks to us wherever we are. We thank you for the people of Gambella. We pray that you will be with them today. And thank you for giving us a bit of a glimpse into the meaning of your word because we've learned something about their life. And we thank you for this in the name of Jesus. Amen.